With the video game industry raking in billions of dollars every year, you know there are companies looking to take advantage and earn a piece of that delicious gaming pie. Unfortunately, these companies are making profits by taking advantage of gamers with the release of fake consoles and some major ripoffs. Come see the best of the worst to find some Nintendo Switch replicas, a Batman-themed video game console, and a classic ripoff that has been doing the Game Boy injustice for multiple years now. Most of the consoles could win awards in the design department, but lack actual function and gameplay. Ever see those Wish.com ads with prices that seem too good to be true? Well, we're here with another one. Nicknamed the Nintendo Switch Vita, the handheld gaming console simply known as the X7 has been duping gamers for years. If you squint and tilt your head, the console looks kind of like a Nintendo Switch, thanks to the bright and vivid color scheme. If you tilt your head in the opposite direction, then you'll get some major Vita vibes. The major problem? The cheap console doesn't really play any Vita or Switch games. The 5-inch screen offers access to game downloads, essentially becoming a low-grade tablet with connections to game emulators and apps. The actual interior of the console seems to shift depending on what listing you shop for, including a mix between 8 and 16 gigs of memory. The promoted TV connection only works with standard RCA connections and isn't really worth your time. Chances are you'll be playing the old glitch and restart game more than any of your actual games. And the promotional picture with a Super Mario Maker logo? Yeah, you're not gonna play that one on the X7. Welcome to the OG of ripoff consoles. Back when the Nintendo Game Boy was flying off shelves and ushering in a new era of portable gaming long before everyone was playing Candy Crush, companies were already taking advantage of clueless parents. Why play the simple Game Boy when you could own the Game Child? Remember all those junky LCD games from Tiger Electronics? Well, that's essentially what the Game Child was, but encased in a Game Boy-style case. Instead of the classic Nintendo A and B combo, the Game Child features a stiff D-pad and a single button. The games were repetitive, boring, and oddly, the Game Child features a battery compartment just like the Game Boy, but with no actual batteries in it. Multiple versions of the Game Child were released, including motorcycle games, dinosaur games, and creative titles like City Fighter and Desert War. Imagine the disappointment on Christmas morning when a child expected a new Game Boy packed with Tetris and was forced to fake a smile as they played LCD soccer. Yikes. For every new generation of gaming, Sony has supplied us with a PlayStation. Well, some cheap overseas factory would not be undone as they followed in Sony's footsteps with the PolyStation. The design team didn't just take a page from Sony, they took all the pages as they developed and released PolyStation consoles. Using these same color schemes and designs, the consoles were made to play multiple types of cartridges and ran a simulator with a whole lot of crappy 16-bit action. The PolyStation wanted to dupe players so bad the companies even included CD trays without an actual disk drive. Now that's dedication. And with the PS2 came the PolyStation 2. You get the picture. The controller even attempted to duplicate the DualShock, but instead of analog sticks, the lightweight plastic featured two input buttons, making the whole layout clunky and uncomfortable. The sad part is that while the PlayStation has evolved and improved over the years, the PolyStation has only changed the exterior mold. Every junky game remains on the inside. With the PS5 due for release this fall, you can expect the PlayStation 5 with next-gen access to hacked versions of the original Super Mario Bros. Oh boy. We already saw how companies like Sony failed to duplicate the success of the Wii with PlayStation Move, so why did third-party companies think they even had a chance? Well, they certainly tried, including the rip-off console known as the Weenie. We're guessing it's pronounced Weenie, which is just a pretty silly name for a game console in the first place. But that's not even the goofiest part of this ripoff. The graphics are horrendous, and the pre-packaged games include sports like tennis and bowling that look worse than a Super Nintendo. Not to mention, if you make it far enough to actually enjoy any of these games, the motion controls are often unresponsive and glitchy. Don't be fooled by controller add-ons like a tennis racket or ping pong paddle. This is pretty much as bad as it gets. Even the non-motion games built into the system are pretty junky. Essentially, a whole little amount of money was poured into a white design scheme to fool people into thinking they were buying Wii Sports. While Nintendo could sue a lot of these ripoff companies for copying their patented designs, it's a little weird to hear that a company was actually suing Nintendo. Enter the Wikipad. Now it's not a printed version of every Wikipedia page ever. The Wikipad is a handheld tablet device where you can pull the tablet out and have access to wireless controllers? Sounds kind of similar to Joy-Cons. 
Maybe in a vague way, but it was close enough for the company to sue Nintendo over patent issues. The funny part is that anyone who's played both the Nintendo Switch and the Wikipad would never compare the two. When the Wikipad goes into the wireless controller modes, the controllers remain connected like some weird type of bicycle handles. And without a tablet stand for a TV connection, removing the controller seems pointless. You can't even split them in two for multiplayer games. The Wikipad actually offers some pretty decent tablet gaming options, but is nothing when compared to other tablets like the iPad or Samsung Galaxy. Let's just say the added controllers don't add much fun to Fortnite, especially when they lag or malfunction. Nintendo won that lawsuit, but the Wikipad got all the headlines and marketing they needed for a nice boost in sales. With bright colors and simple inputs, the POW Kitty A19 feels like a Game Boy Color on steroids. The screen is only 3.5 inches, but still delivers pretty great graphics and backlight features. Emulators built into the POW Kitty allows you to play Sega, Nintendo, and MAME ROMs. The POW Kitty, sorry, we just like saying POW Kitty a lot. What a name. Anyway, much like other ripoff consoles, the controls and inputs are junk compared to systems like the 3DS. Sold with a circular style D pad, many of the games on the POW Kitty A19 are unplayable due to the junky controls. But you could upgrade for a traditional D pad as long as you take apart the POW Kitty and install the thing yourself. Yeah, good luck with that. The micro SD card allows you to store a whole library of ROMs. Like many other consoles, you gotta visit sketchy sites to order the thing and wait a few weeks for the overseas shipment before you start playing. In that time, you could run a pretty great emulator on your Android phone. If you loved visiting malls as a kid, chances are you came across a kiosk selling some sort of rip-off console. Those unregulated kiosks got away with so much, including acting like these consoles were the must-own Christmas presents of 2003. Anyway, the consoles were all essentially the same. A pair of cheap plastic controllers was paired with a light gun and packaged with hundreds of NES-style games. The console was often shaped like an Xbox or PS2, even though the contents and hardware could fit in the palm of your hand. Our favorite ripoff of them all? It has to be the Batman. Not only for the fact that the console featured an extra T in Batman, but because the console has absolutely nothing to do with Batman. There's not even a Batman game included in the ROMs, and long before Arkham Asylum, Batman games were mostly junk anyways. On top of that, the game box art doesn't even feature Michael Keaton's Batman or Val Kilmer. Heck, we'd even respect an Adam West Batman on the package. Instead, we get 1997's Batman and Robin. Yeah, Mr. Bat Nipples himself, George Clooney. Yeesh, we'd rather just watch Batman and Robin again. Why buy a used PSP when you could purchase a brand new Retro Game 350? The handheld system allows you to play PS1 ROMs, along with a number of other systems. When it comes to rip-off consoles, the Retro Game 350 is worth the bigger price tag because the company behind the machine actually puts some effort into the controller design. Not only is the analog stick placement comfortable, but they feel smooth and react like they're supposed to. The D-pad works smoothly, and emulated games come extremely close to their original releases. Oddly enough, the console includes inputs and options that don't quite work yet. A mini HDMI input should work for TV connections, but their firmware isn't quite up to date yet. You're stuck in portable mode with a retro game 350, but that's not always a bad thing. The other negative? The console comes packaged with an empty software package. All the games and ROMs you gotta go hunting on your own for. From there, it's all about testing each one. So, you'll have a whole lot of trial and error before you can actually sit down and enjoy the thing. Still though, if you're going to go down the knockoff route, the Retro Game 350 isn't your worst option. Taking a page from Microsoft's weird naming scheme for the Xbox, we present the PX3600. It's like Xbox 360, but times 10. As in 10 times the ripoff. Depending on where you buy it, the console could be referred to as the PX9000, X Game 3000, and probably soon the PX Series XX. Series 20? It's like, I don't know. The controllers look like the original Xbox Duke went on a keto diet, and the promoted rumble feature is nothing more than a slight vibration which seems to randomly trigger without any specific in-game association. And you never know which controller will come with the vibration. Out of the four packaged controllers, only one actually has the rumble feature. The controllers also feature four input buttons, but a majority of the Atari games built into the system only need one. The best game you'll play with the PX3600 is shooting everything right into your trash can. It's not even worth plugging into your television. Don't let the fancy clear green plastic fool ya. And we save the best of the worst for last, because the Dreamcast isn't just some console knockoff. 
It actually uses a real Dreamcast console to play games. In a design that could have saved the real Dreamcast from disappearing, the Dreamcast is a portable version of the Dreamcast with a flip-up screen and battery pack. The console runs Dreamcast discs, and several versions of the console were sold before Sega slammed the legal hammer down and ended the Dreamcast for good. Along with official games, the Dreamcast allowed you to play burned games, video CDs, and MP3 CDs. Basically, this was the Switch years and years before Nintendo even came up with the concept. While original sales ended, you could dig around and find the Dreamcast for sale from various websites. If you still have old Dreamcast games lying around, the purchase might be worth it. Yeah, we definitely want to try out the Dreamcast. Do you think the original console was underrated? You ever waste money on a ripoff console? Which one would you want to own? Your parents ever get duped by a crappy console or ripoff game? Eh, we've all been there. Well, let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to The Gamer for more great content.